Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas from the Causers! Merry Christmas! Driving the rain! Merry Christmas! Happy Christmas, everybody! Merry Christmas! 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 Merry Christmas, everyone! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! We love you. Have a great Christmas! Merry Christmas, church. Have a wonderful time. Too much chocolate. God bless you.
Sometimes what can happen, right, when we're not mentally well, withdrawing, yeah, and closing off, yeah, because of all kinds of reasons, but shame, stigma, fear of judgment, that's right, loneliness, you know, all of that kind of stuff. It's it's a natural response. It isn't is isn't it when we're it is when we're not doing well. It's, it's and it's the worst place to be. It is. It's it's like in your body if you. If you injure a shoulder, you tend to favor it, yeah. and you tend because you tend to protect it. Yeah. And it's the same with your mental health. If you're feeling not at your best, mm -hmm. you tend to protect yourself, and you think protecting means stay away from everybody. Yeah. Because I don't want to inflict what I'm going through on anybody else. That's that's another lie. Is yes. I don't want to add to other people's problems by telling them what I'm going through. Yeah. And of course, there's an extreme to that, right? Sure. Where yeah, yeah. you know you sit down with somebody, and it's never about you. It's always all about what what's happening to them. I'm not talking about that. Yeah. But I but I am saying, um, you know, the scriptures tell us to share each other's load. Yeah. To get him to be our brother's keeper, to get involved in each other's lives so that we actually know what's happening with each other. And and that's one of the one of the things I love about building church the way we build church is that we're we're we weigh heavily on relationship. Yeah. We're actually very um, very reluctant to build where there isn't relationship yeah. because I think relationship at the end of the day is what keeps keeps it together it is. so yeah relationships are important for mental health yeah yeah we could talk for a long time apparently we could <laughs> oh, <better. laughs> 
Happy Sunday. Welcome uh, to this beautiful window between Christmas and the new year uh, where we're hopped up on candy cane and thinking about how we want to live in the future. Uh, no wonder resolutions go super well. Um, I'm really excited to spend some time together this morning. Now, if you're like me and you've been watching online, I know that there's, there might be kids running or cats clawing and all kinds of stuff happening in the background. But I really believe that God has an encounter for us this morning that's going to minister to our spirits and, and walk us into a greater degree of freedom and joy for the season ahead. I want to talk about living in awe and wonder. And this is something that uh, is important to me because uh, it helps us to appreciate God on the move all around us in every, every day and every moment of life. Um, it's easy at this time of year to take in a little bit of awe and wonder. I get to preach today with a nice Christmas tree. Oh, knocking it over. Um, I, I remember when I was growing up hearing Mike Nicholson talk about how excited he'd get if he heard a little sound on the roof during Christmas. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing to live with a sense of awe and wonder. Um, at the same time during COVID and over this past long season that we've had, I've become aware myself at how uh, the same and different life is. And we know that there's so many different things happening right now in our world and so much that's going on and yet there's still some things that are so similar. And so the disconnect between the two can be so big. One of the things that I've noticed and I've seen it in myself and our family and I've heard it from other people is just a bit of a sense of criticism and critical thinking that's creeping in and robbing some joy. In part, it's from sitting at home or at work in a different context, dealing with so much complexity. We're flooded with social media, we're flooded with bad news, and it becomes really easy for our minds to start to go down a negative path. And at times that can create a lens that we start to see the world through. Uh, and it can make us more critical of ourselves, more critical of the people in our lives, more critical of our world and at times what's happening in the church. And so today I want to guide us through some reflections um, and look to the Lord for a way forward um, into blessing and wonder and awe. So in honor of Christmas, I tried to think of what scripture would be the most festive and uplifting and thrilling and landed on Ananias and Sapphira. So we're going to watch a short video clip that walks us through the story of Ananias and Sapphira. We're going to go kind of serious for a minute and then we'll come back to a happy place. This clip has a bit of a Nightmare Before Christmas vibe. So it's also uh, fitting, I guess. It's festive in a, its own way. There's no pumpkins or anything, but uh, watch the clip and then we'll come back and explore it a bit more. There are some stories that end with the quaint little phrase, and they lived happily ever after. But this is not one of those stories. This is the grim tale of Ananias and Sapphira. The early church had begun to flourish, and all the believers were getting along quite splendidly. They shared everything they had with one another, claiming nothing as their own. There were no needy people among them. Those who owned fields or houses sold them and brought the proceeds to the apostles as a gift. Joseph was one such man who sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles as an offering. And oh, what a wonderful blessing it was to everyone. All the believers were encouraged and celebrated Joseph's selfless act. Well, not everyone. A couple named Ananias and Sapphira, who were counted among the believers, saw the way Joseph was admired and grew very jealous. He thinks he's better than us, they grumbled to each other. We deserve that kind of attention. They dwelt on it day and night. Finally, one night, they devised a plan to sell a piece of land, secretly keeping part of the money for themselves and giving the rest to the apostles. They would not necessarily say they were giving all of the money they received from the sale. They would just let everyone assume it, 
and presto, they would instantly be famous as self-sacrificing believers who surrendered everything to Jesus. So, with his wife's consent, Ananias sold the land, secretly kept part of the money, and brought the remainder to the apostles. But Peter saw right through Ananias, saying, Ananias, why have you let evil fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor dead. Everyone who heard the news was filled with fear. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, Sapphira came in, not knowing what had happened. Everyone nervously watched as Peter asked her, Was this the price you and your husband received for your land? The room fell silent. Yes, she replied. That was the price? Peter responded, How could the two of you even think of conspiring to test God like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door, and they will carry you out too. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than she also fell down dead. When the young men returned, they found her body. They carried her out and buried her beside her husband. By this time, the whole church, and in fact, everyone who heard of these things, had a newfound respect for God. So, unfortunately, there's no happy ending in this tale, but there is a warning here to take God very seriously, dare I say, <laughs> deadly serious. <laughs>
So we're going to look at a fairly well-known concept uh, that was introduced a long time ago by a guy named David Burns in 1980 in a book called Feeling Good. And these are cognitive distortions. They're common patterns that come up in our thoughts and our feelings that can lead us to a bit of a negative place. Now, everyone experiences them at different times in different ways. And one of the whole points of this is as we can start to recognize these thoughts and feelings, we can deal with them and move to a healthier way of thinking and feeling. So I'm going to lead us through some of these cognitive distortions. If you think of the backlands and how uh, they talk about laughing at lies, I think you'll recognize that essentially these are lies that we can laugh at and adopt a more healthy attitude. So number one, all or nothing thinking. If, if a situation isn't perfect, then it's a complete failure. And this can creep in in all kinds of subtle ways. Sometimes a way that, uh, that I can see happening in the church at times would be that thought of, if I don't have a title, sorry, I spat. Whew. I always feel the need to point it out, friends. <laughs> Just happened again, I apologize. Um, okay, so all or nothing thinking. If things aren't perfect, uh, it's a complete failure. Uh, so in, in the church, there's sometimes this sense of, if I don't have a title, then I don't matter. Uh, and it's not true. You are, every believer is filled with the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. We all walk in authority. We're all gifted by the Holy Spirit to influence our world and call heaven to earth. Every believer matters. In the body of Christ, there's no part that's not important. And titles at times when we lay hands on someone and release them into a calling at the directing of the Holy Spirit, that can help us to grow and mature, but every person still matters. And we only grow as every person does the work that God's given us to do. Uh, so that's all or nothing thinking. And we want to uh, try to let that go and uh, have open hands and, and let God uh, take that from us. Another one, overgeneralization. This is Thoughts that tend to be framed with an always or a never. Something happens and your actions like, oh, you always leave your shoes in front of the door. Um, for, for some reason, when we were newly married, I would get home and I have no idea. It never happened again and it didn't happen for long. But I'd come home and I'd take my socks off my feet and I'd throw them uh, into the air. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but it would have been right at that point for Marianne to say, you always take your socks off and throw them. Um, but there's a lot of things that happen in our interactions with one another, sometimes things that aren't great that we need to address and, and work through. But when we frame it with an always or a never, we can get into this place where uh, we can be stuck. Uh, it might be something like, my children always misbehave during a gathering. And so we have this always sense and, and then don't feel like we want our kids to be in a gathering. Uh, whereas there might be some solutions and ways to work it through uh, and ways to engage your kids in, um, in the body of Christ and, and in the relationship with the Lord. So those always and never words tend to be a warning that you can say, oh, I want to adjust my thinking here. Another one is a mental filter. It's when you have a single negative detail that becomes your entire focus, even though there's all kinds of positive things that have happened. So, uh, you know, Bethlehem Live has happened and we had all these people through from the community, but one child tripped and face planted in a pile of poop. You know, that could become your singular focus of, oh no, it was terrible, uh, despite all the wonderful things that had happened. Uh, or uh, you can kind of acknowledge that, well, that wasn't great. Uh, and also acknowledge all of the good things. Now in life, there's a lot of poop and sometimes we fall in it. Uh, and it's really easy when that happens for that to be our focus. Uh, years ago, we were living in the UK and a bird pooped on Marianne's head. And I thought it was hilarious. She did not. Uh, and it was the focus of a little bit of time that day. Uh, but we could move on from that, right? And even in those times and seasons of life that are difficult, God's goodness and provision is there. He's with us. And so there's always more to our lives than the problem that we're looking at. Next, discounting the positive. This is when um, we reject positive experiences saying they don't count. And sometimes if we're lonely and someone reaches out to us uh, and, and it, it's almost like it doesn't count, you know, like, oh, well, people aren't valuing me and I feel so alone. And we can get stuck in this place where we don't recognize the different good things that are happening. Uh, and we, we almost don't count them. 
And so when, when that's happening, it's good just to, to take a minute, maybe even make a list and focus on what are some of those things that are happening, that are healthy, that, that could count towards reframing and understanding this situation. Another classic, jumping to conclusions, being a mind reader or fortune teller. Uh, when something happens that we kind of make assumptions about what a person was thinking or what their intentions were without talking to them and sometimes our interpretation is, is just wrong. And that can happen all the time. It can happen especially uh, across leadership in this beautiful church that's growing all of these locations and our friends and partners all over. Uh, there's lots of opportunities for communication to break down. Uh, and so we want to choose to believe the best in one another and not to, you know, jump to conclusions about people's intentions when, when something's gone, gone badly. Um, because uh, we are surrounded by beautiful people who love one another and we, we love each other. So we want to believe the best in one another. The next one is magnification. It's when we kind of exaggerate the size of the problem and minimize uh, the, the value of desirable things. Some of these are very similar. There's that pattern where we can tend to focus on a problem and, and our, our view of the whole picture uh, can get lost. Uh, emotional reasoning is where we take our emotions and our feelings and treat them like they're facts and don't, don't challenge or weigh them. Uh, I love, there was an example in this list of, I feel terrified about going on airplanes. It must be very dangerous to fly. And I love that connection because sometimes we have these feelings that we bring uh, into a place where we say it's true. So often if we're lonely again, and this can happen in COVID, which is why I'm highlighting it, that you might feel lonely, which could lead you to a place of saying, so I'm not valued by other people. Uh, other people don't think about me. Other people don't, don't care. And it's that feeling that we have, which is a very valid feeling at times of loneliness, uh, but it can lead us to a place where we think that there's a truth there when really, uh, you know, there's, there's people that love us and, and these networks of people that we can reach out to and, and find ways to connect even in the middle of those times. Um, just a few more. Should statements. Uh, often the word should doesn't lead us into life. Uh, there's things like must, ought, have to, and should, where we can set up all of these expectations for how people should behave, how we should behave, what people should accomplish, what they shouldn't accomplish. Uh, and sometimes we uh, trap ourselves and other people in these expectations um, that aren't, aren't, um, aren't freeing. Uh, and sometimes when, when we have our, a list of shoulds, it can make us feel a bit rebellious. Uh, they shouldn't have done that. They shouldn't have done that. So now I'm going to not do that. Uh, and we kind of opt out or tap out of certain situations um, based on some of those feelings of, of uh, expectations that weren't met. Two more. First, labeling. Labeling is when you have... Um, kind of some, some negative thoughts that you attach to identity. So if you've not done something that you expected and you feel bad about yourself to say, you know what, I'm a failure. And, and that negative label comes on and sits on us and it, it starts to affect our, our own potential and how we see the world and how we walk through it. And sometimes we might put a label on another person. And if it's a negative label, it kind of colors all of the way that we see that person. And it, instead of, you know, being concerned about a specific uh, behavior or thought or word that a person said, we think about them entirely through that lens uh, and it kind of robs us of, of that fellowship with that person. And finally, and this is a, a common and classic one, is personalization and blame. Two parts of the same problem where when we find ourselves in a difficult place, uh, sometimes we can take entirely personal responsibility for it, uh, even though it might not be fully under our control. And we can feel like, oh, this all just fell apart and it's all my fault. Uh, similarly, when we're in a situation like that, we can blame another person and we can say, oh, this all fell apart and it's entirely their fault without considering ways that we may have contributed to that problem. And so these types of patterns and distortions and thinking uh, kind of seep in subtly at times and can rob us of joy and rob us of that sense of awe and wonder in life. Um, so with a lot of these thought processes, when we're growing up, 
often we'll have parents or friends that we interact with and they help us to kind of think differently and they challenge us when we're stuck in unhealthy thought patterns. And it's true in community as well as adults that often our natural thought processes can get a bit muddy and unclear. And when we sit down with a friend uh, and we talk something through, often we see things differently because of the grace that happens in that conversation or through fellowship. And I know that during COVID, that a lot of those relationships have been interrupted in different and important ways. It's harder to sit down. It's hard to get that time to really have that heart connection uh, and to talk through some of these things. So it's really easy in our, in our new context to be at home, kind of isolated from other people, spending a lot of time on our own, to be self-focused and for some of these thoughts to start to get more established. So I wanted to bring it forward to encourage us to think through the way that we're thinking about our lives and the people around us and just to let the light of the Holy Spirit uh, come. We know that our lives are transformed by changing the way that we think. And so I want to invite you to ask the Lord to lead you through a process of reflecting on some of those things. Now, for me, there have been some key moments uh, where I've recognize the need to change in my own thinking around these things. Quite recently, uh, there was a moment in our home uh, where there was some negativity and critical speaking that was happening and I just realized that I was setting that into our atmosphere in our home and it, I just wanted it to change. And so quickly from recognizing that, we were able to shift the way that we were talking uh, about a situation and about a person and completely reoriented us and just released blessing into that situation, just from changing the way that we were thinking about it and letting God shift our perspective. Uh, going back in time, there's two really foundational moments that uh, came to me as a learning moment around criticism and thinking really um, kind of uh, in a critique way about things. One uh, was years ago, um, you, you may or may not know that I'm a little bit of a lefty politically, uh, and we were having a, a bit of an election party to watch a debate. This is years back, and it was a Canadian one, not American. Uh, and afterwards, I just started speaking so critically about the government and about different policies, and it was a bit nasty uh, in a way. And afterwards, Marianne, bless her, she's real gracious, asked me, what was your intention? You know, what, what did you want to accomplish with that communication? She's good, right? I was like, oh, well, I guess I kind of wanted to help people appreciate where I was coming from and my perspective. She's like, yeah, I don't think you won anyone over to, to your way of thinking. I was like, oh, you know, my intention wasn't being met by the way that I was choosing to communicate. And I thought about the power of our words and how we frame our, our ideas. Another time I was sitting in a Starbucks and I was uh, just digitally joining a kind of an action campaign on some political issue and uh, the lovely and fabulous uh, Vicky Kreitzer happened to be wandering in and got a coffee and said hi and what, what are you doing Ben and I just explained and I think as much as it's fine to be engaged politically and do all of those things she had a discerning spirit and she reminded me that the weapons of our warfare are supernatural. We don't just go out and fight and advocate and use all of the tools that exist in the world, though there's a time to protest and a time to stand up for causes, but that we actually have tools from heaven at our disposal to make a change. And it was a shifting point for me to realize that I have all of this resource uh, of my Heavenly Father to engage with these things here on earth. And for us as a community, I want to leave us with some reflections on what are some of those supernatural tools that we have to live in awe and in wonder. Number one, coming back to Ananias and Sapphira, the fear of the Lord. <laughs> Having a deep respect for God and for his holy people will help us to feel motivated to get our thinking in line. Not that anyone around you is going to drop dead, I'm not suggesting that. There's just this desire to please the Lord that comes from understanding how big and how great and how worthy he is. Uh, and to say, yeah, God, I, I want to do the work in me uh, to live in a way that's an offering poured out for you. 
and that I'm not living for my own thinking and my own um, goals and my own viewpoint on the world, but I'm going to give that up to follow your way. So that was the fear of the Lord and a deep respect for God. Number two, thankfulness. Thankfulness is one of the best ways out of a critical spirit. When we can stop and honor the Lord and thank God for all of the good things that he's done. And when we allow that to kind of spill over into being thankful for the people in our lives and the people that he's placed in the church around us, such beautiful people in Cape Breton and Peterborough and Montreal and Mississauga and all across Ottawa here and every other part of this world, God's good people are there and we're so thankful for one another. Um, and just want to slow down for a second and just encourage you in this moment with whatever's going on in your home to take a second and tell God thank you. Pick something and thank him. Recently in our home, uh, I just gathered the kids and we had a quick little thank thankful circle. Just sat, sat on the floor like, what's going on? Just sit down. We're going to have a gratitude circle. You go. Tell me one thing you're thankful for. We went around. They weren't super profound. We want to cultivate a culture of thankfulness because uh, it's such a healthy thing. We come into the presence of God with thanksgiving. And so in our daily lives, we get to have these encounters. Every time we turn our thankfulness to the Lord, we're stepping into his presence. The next natural outflow of that, number three, is encouragement and honor. We can move away from thinking really critically about our lives by taking time intentionally to encourage one another. And when we start to meditate on our thankfulness for one another, we can choose to voice those things to the people that we're thinking about. It might be sending a message to someone and saying, you know, I was thinking about you today. I really appreciate this about you. Uh, I'm really thankful that we get to be friends. Uh, or, or it can come out in all kinds of ways. Some people are really creative and they, I don't know, they make macaroni art to thank one another and encourage one another. Uh, you can do it however you want. But our, our encouragement and our honoring of one another can also be supernatural. The Holy Spirit's on the move and we can ask the Lord to lead us in encouragement for one another. I remember um, not long ago uh, meeting together with some brothers and sharing something personal in my life that was really challenging and difficult. Uh, and the next day I was sitting at home and in the evening I got a little voice message through Messenger and it was Gualberto. Uh, and when, you know, he was just going at her in tongues. He left this voicemail just like praying in tongues over me. And I just held it and I listened and I wept and I thanked God that somebody cared and they were reaching out and they were just offering a supernatural tool of encouragement. Something that seems so strange to this world to leave a voicemail in tongues, but it just like went right into my spirit and God did a deep work. And so we have those kinds of weapons. We have these abilities to, to help one another and build each other up through the Holy Spirit. And it's very hard to be critical about someone when we're looking to the Lord to stir and encourage and build them up. Number four is grace. Covering one another with grace, covering ourselves with grace, freeing, freeing ourselves from criticism about our own life and about the people around us. And just to recognize that God's grace is so good and so massive and God is constantly being kind and gracious with us and forgiving us and restoring us and we get to be the same with the people in our lives and the same with ourselves that we can step and walk in 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 line with the grace of God for Marianne and I in our marriage grace means that sometimes uh, in in tough bits we just say we're growing, <laughs> we're growing. We know that we haven't reached, you know, our ultimate destination and, and we don't have to be perfect to experience grace. Grace is there because we're not. Uh, and so grace comes in and it glues us together and helps us to love and have patience and kindness with one another, even as we're growing. And that's true in your family. It's true uh, in your relationships, your marriages, your friendships, and in the church. Let's be people who are filled and seasoned with grace. Number five, deal with conflict. 
The Holy Spirit has inspired scripture and scripture tells us that when we have an offense with someone that we can go to them and talk it through. It's a good thing to do. And there is, uh, you know, certainly this expectation that we can let offense fall off of us. We don't have to be offended at everything, but sometimes it happens. And a good, simple test to know whether or not it did fall off is whether you're thinking about it. <laughs> if you're still thinking about it, if you're talking about it, uh, then there's an offense that needs to be dealt with. And so it's time for a conversation. Uh, and you know, that can still be strategic and it can be filled with grace, but go and put it right. Uh, whether you were offended or whether you know that you offended someone else. Scripture tells us to go and deal with that. And we can be clear and we can be assertive in our communication, but we don't wanna let anything grow in that space that's gonna start to color our thoughts and our thinking and our heart to be critical. We can let it go, work it through, and then return to that place of awe and wonder and fellowship with each other. Finally, the last one is putting your hope in Jesus. When we lose hope in a situation, it becomes impossible to see a way forward. And we're so fortunate to know the Lord and to know that nothing is impossible for God. There's no situation that he can't resurrect, that his power isn't big enough to deal with. And recently, Mike Nicholson read the scripture in a, in a gathering, Revelation chapter five, verses one, uh, to five, and I want to read this from the New Living Testament, New Living Translation, pardon me. It says, Then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. There was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals on the scroll and open it? But no one in heaven or on earth, or under the earth, was able to open the scroll and read it. It says, Then I began to weep bitterly, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and read it. We can have those moments where we look at the grand purpose of God, where there's been prophetic words and we have vision and we have, you know, just such a, a firm belief in what God wants to establish. And yet in that moment, we can seem stuck and it can seem like there's no way forward. Like the purpose of God has hit a roadblock. And I just love this moment of breakthrough because here's John in Revelation, a man who was intimately close with Jesus and He's looking into heaven and he's weeping bitterly. He's lost hope. And it says, but one of the 24 elders said to me, stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Jesus has won. We have a winner on our side and he makes us more than conquerors. And so in every situation that we face, certainly there's times to ask questions. There's times to sort through problems, sort through conflict. There's times to acknowledge that something isn't okay and to make a plan uh, to move forward. We, won't, we don't wanna get stuck in that space where things are colored in a way that starts to shape our view and it becomes negative because Jesus is one, his goodness is available. And when we can shift our eyes off of ourselves and let go of some of these patterns of negative thinking, then we start to see Jesus in a whole new light and we see him reigning and ruling over the situation that we're bringing before him. We get to bring those problems to the throne room and set them down at his feet and say, God, I need you to move here. Would you move? And I think of that, that prophetic word in scripture about the dry bones where God said, can these bones live? And the prophet said, only you know, Lord. We bring those moments to God. We lay it at his feet and then he moves. And sometimes God will move sovereignly and sometimes he'll move sovereignly through you. And he told the prophet to speak to the bones 
to speak and call the winds of God on and see what will happen. And then God began to move as the prophet allowed his viewpoint to be lined up uh, in the presence of God. So Jesus is our hope. So in this season, as we approach a new year, uh, as a church, we've been called to do something significant. We've been called to be a blessing to the nations of the world. We've been called to see the kingdom of God firmly established on earth and to just tear open that divide between heaven and earth. And all of us have a part to play. Us together with the other churches that Jesus has gathered in this world, he is building his church and we are a beautiful bride. And we have some choices to make. There's always a hard way and there's an easy way. And so the scripture teaches us that the power of life and death is in the tongue. And it says those that love it will eat its fruit. There's times I can identify where I've been speaking really negatively or critically about something and it's left that taste of death in my mouth. I thought, oh, I don't, I don't want to do that. And God invites us to choose life. And so as we approach the year ahead, Let's, let's take a moment to reflect. Let's bring our honest thoughts and feelings before the Lord and lay it at his feet and say, okay, God, here we are. We're calling your glory down now. We're calling your presence into this situation. We believe that you're great and that you're great in us, that you're great in one another and that together we're gonna see your purpose fulfilled. That together that every word and every promise you've given is about to be fulfilled among us because you do good and you're a good father. So for the year ahead, I wanna encourage you to embrace all those things and choose life. For those of you who are watching this morning and who have may never given your life to Jesus, we want to give you an opportunity to do that this morning, to respond to the gospel and to respond to the goodness of God that's reaching out to you this morning. God loves you and he knows you. The fact of the matter is that we have all fallen short of God's standard, which is perfection. And it's for that reason that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins to crucify everything that would have ever separated us from the love of the Father, to crucify everything that you have done in the past, everything that you will do, and everything that may have been done unto you that could have possibly ever separated you from the love of God. And in just a moment here, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to respond. If you have never made this decision to follow Jesus, I'd like to encourage you to pray a simple prayer with me. The Bible says, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. Saved from an eternity without God and saved into a relationship with him. So if that's you this morning, I'd encourage you just to pray along with me. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. This morning, I give you my life. Come and be the Lord of my life. And today, I receive your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Awesome. If you've just prayed that prayer with me, I just want to encourage you that that's the best decision that you'll ever make in your whole life. It's a great decision to follow Jesus and he has such great plans for you ahead. We would love to hear if you have made that decision this morning and I'd love to encourage you to click the live prayer button at the bottom of your screen or click connect with us at the top of your screen and let us know that you've just made that decision and you'd like to start growing in your relationship with Christ. We're so excited to be with you on this journey. And for everyone else, I pray a blessing over you and your household and wish you a great week this week. We look forward to connecting with you online throughout the course of the week and see you next Sunday.